<laughs> and it's the same thing when you think about yoga, the bar might be the quietest place in general, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. The smoothie, the smoothie bar down the down the pavilion is is much busier. Right. <laughs> there you go. Well, Dina, I know we talked before a little bit, but can you tell me outside of kind of your accolades and your story about running, what else, what are the things that kind of like what do you do? What do you enjoy? Why are you in Mammoth Lakes? All that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, I live in Mammoth Lakes. I moved here 21 years ago for the altitude to create the Mammoth Track Club here with Coach B. Hill and uh, Meb Kefleski and his coach, Bob Larson. And uh, I fell in love with the area. I had been coming up here in high school, but I really love the simplicity of a mountain town and the uh, really just like the sanctuary of space that allows you to focus and get your work in. And so I love that. Now that my the height of my competitive career is over, it's also an easy space to be able to contemplate next steps and how to give back. And so it's been a really rewarding past half decade of, of seeing refreshing ways that I could give back in the sport, empowering people with mental strength and, um, and, and helping in that capacity, along with being able to travel, travel the world and still be able to engage at the races. No, that's, I mean, you touched on all these things that I want to talk about too, but, um, and I'm, I'm sure you've done this a lot before, so you kind of, kind of know the, the routine, but you said you moved there with your coaches. Is that right? Yes, moved here with my husband coaches and soon to be the, the top athletes, top distance runners from around the country. So it was just wanting to get people together to work, work at altitude, but doing it together so we could all bring out the best in one another. Do you think that collaboration really helped you kind of push yourself and push everybody else around you? How's, how's that work for you? I think collaboration is the the number one story behind every success story, whether you're a corporation or a team, it comes with working together. So I think that that is critical to have great minds working together and also great athletes that we can sharpen each other's tools and, um, and also keep, keep the workspace very social, which has always also been very important to me, making sure that I meet up with my friends every day and share some, some miles together. It gets me excited to get out the door and get into my shoes each day. And I love the fact that you talked about collaboration, especially when most people on the outside of the running world consider it to be such an individualistic sport. And I think, you know, when you get into the community of running, it, it's completely different. And I think, that's what's so nice about it is um, you start feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself. And you, even though you're racing against your own personal bests and your own kind of records and, and whatever, it's, it's something that you're striving to do with others and, and kind of you bring other people for the ride and uplift others. And it's not necessarily you're competing against one another. You are in a sense, but at the same time, it's more of yourself kind of pushing each other, but also pushing yourself in, in that way. Is that true? Absolutely true that the collaboration helps everyone um, get that similar uplift in the ways that they need it. Running is a great sport and that it gives us what we need each day, whether it's whether it's some quiet time to troubleshoot a problem or whether it's our, our social hour with, with teammates. But I also think that that's what makes the, um, the racing industry so um, intoxicating for so many people. The marathon starting lines, 45, 50,000 people on the starting line together. And that to me is really what won me over to, uh, to road racing is that sense of community and camaraderie that comes with towing the line with thousands of people that you don't know, but you have so much in common with. Yeah, and I, and I think some people are scratching the surface of that, especially with the rise of these like 5Ks and these Spartan races and all these different unique type of engagements, but I think it's one of those things that people are really starting to be more gravitated towards. And I think through this pandemic, even though it was really hard on a lot of people, they found solace in, in, in running and that kind of that piece where they're doing virtual marathons or they're doing virtual 5Ks and just competing in that sense, but also doing it with other people. It's not just against, again, themselves, which I love. So, you, you mentioned, or we talked a little bit before we started recording, but like Mammoth Lakes has a lot of events and, and you're kind of at this place now with what you do, kind of this entrepreneurial spirit, right? You kind of taken your, your passion, your life and, and brought it into full circle where 
now you're hosting events. What is that? How was that transition? What did that look like for you? Yeah, you know, I was, I've been to a lot of events to know what works. So I took some of the things that I've learned from traveling the globe and the um, hospitality being one of them. That was um, one of the big things when I traveled somewhere, feeling like I was welcome and part of their family, the event family, and being able to um, to really just share the community that I love with, with people coming to, to visit and recreate here. And so that's, that's why I get so involved in community events, um, why I volunteered over 100 hours at our vaccine clinics and, um, and our food bank at the beginning of the pandemic. It's just a way to say thank you to the community that supported me for the past 21 years. So it does feel like a place of privilege to give back in that way, um, but also rewarding, I think. Um, I think the reason that random acts of kindness are so powerful is that there is a lot of gratification that comes with, with sharing and giving. And so to be able to do that, um, to have the time to do that, to get my training in in the morning and then be able to give back the rest of the day is um, I'm very thankful for the, for the sport, for giving me the, um, the privilege of, of being able to do that, but also uh, living in a place that, um, that I can uh, be proud of and supportive of is really important. And the same goes for the races that I travel to. I love to be able to, to share those moments, those morning shakeout runs, time in the lobby, uh, visiting with, with other runners and coaches and, um, and spectators that to me, that's part of what, what gives my life the greatest joy is that sharing those moments together. I can forget times and places at a lot of, a lot of races, but I'll always remember those moments. That's a human connection piece, right? I love it. Yes. And did Tim have something, Tim? Where you're, yeah, he's got his little race? hand raised up next. So. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, um, yeah Dean, I, I noticed when you uh, and Meb were training together, First of all, it's unusual for men and women to train together. And I thought that was very unique and very interesting. But it was really the first time since Jeff Galloway, Jack Batchelor, and Frank had trained together, sort of semi-lived together, because the trend nowadays is it's all top secret workouts and nobody's doing what we do. And so we've got to keep that under wraps. And and I thought I thought when you guys sort of reintroduced that idea that it would spread. And yet in, in the running community, it has, do you, do you know why people don't collaborate as much as uh, you and I both think they should? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why people think their training has to be a secret and why they have to, um, why they have to be cryptic about, about their, um, their programs. But to me, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't promote the sport in any good way that when you share the intervals, when you go to sea level, when you, when you're at altitude, what, um, why you tax different energy systems and stimulate them in different ways. Um, that's important knowledge and, and to continue to reinvent the wheel all the time isn't, isn't fair for upcoming generations. And so to be able to share as much as possible, with other coaches and athletes, I think is so critically important. It's, um, and I all obviously only learned that through Coach B Hill, who wrote coaching curriculums um, after working with athletes and knew what worked and so wrote about it and shared. And for a man that has spent his entire life studying and gathering information, for him to be able to share it in a split second um, with anybody who asks, I think is a priceless quality to have. Absolutely. And, and I think that speaks volumes to, to how you've kind of like taken that step too. And, and one of the things that really impressed me is what you said is like, it shouldn't be a secret and it shouldn't be so cryptic, but we still find that even younger organizations are still trying to say like, we have the secret sauce come to us. Do you see like that as like a, almost like a competitive and money grab type situation? Or do you think it's, you know, because they're so focused on the business and not on the athlete, do you think that there's kind of some play happening there where it's kind of, I wouldn't say having a hardship on the running kind of world, but do you think that's kind of limiting the factors of the growth of the sport? I think it absolutely limits the growth of the sport. Um, like we started the conversation talking about collaboration and that's not just within your team, that's within the sport, but then even broadening it. And if this works in the sport, why can't it work in the 
corporate world and sharing it across the board. And I think um, that's when we really get to reach our potential is when we have all that really priceless information. Coach Vijo, again, he's the reason that I wrote my book and put it all out there, even journal entries that I wanted to burn and shred and parts of my journey that I was embarrassed to share because it showed me in, vulnerable, in a vulnerable state that the reason you share is so people don't have to go through that in order to to get the best out of himself. So I dedicated my book to him because he really showed me through example, not just by telling me, really showed, showed me by example that the value of everything we have, whether it's a cup of coffee or, um, or time or food on the table or knowledge that we know, the value of it really increases the moment we get to share it with others because then it becomes, then it, then it lives on in eternity. And so I think it's our job to understand the truths of the sport, but then share them in a big way. I love that. And I love how much passion and sincerity you speak when you talk about Coach V Hill. And, and I, I think that's so empowering to, to the coaches in the world. And, and we work with a lot of coaches. And I think that's something that I want to be able to share with them too, is the power that they have over their student athletes, the athletes that you, they work with is how they really affect you. And it's not necessarily like they don't necessarily go and intentionally say this, this, and this is, this is going to be their, life-changing moment, but it's those things that you take away extrinsically, intrinsically, and they don't even know it, but it's one of those phrases that they may, may change your life. And I think that's something that, you know, sticks with you. You know, you, you mentioned how you moved there and trade with them. He told you to share your vulnerabilities and it's okay to be vulnerable in the sport because that's what makes you, you, and it makes you the person that you are. And I think having coaches like that is a real inspiration to a lot of us, but we, they don't ever get those huge accolades. They don't ever get the, you know, the medals and the, the trophies, but they know that they're making an impact without the kind of the pat on the back and everything. And I, and I think when you're able to speak so highly of somebody as a person, but as also as a coach, it really speaks to that athlete and coach relationship that is so imperative that we don't give credit enough to the coaches and, and so on. So I'd love yeah, to, to hear a little a... bit more about what Coach B. Hill has done for you. Yeah, it, the coach athlete relationship is so critical and even the coach team dynamic is so critical to the success of individuals, but also the team as a whole. And for a coach to expect the best out of their athletes, Coach B. Hill always had high expectations because he says, you know, when my expectations are high, everybody just rises up and reaches them. And I just thought that was so mind blowing to hear that um, right out fresh out of college, like, okay, these expectations aren't something that are going to, that I'm going to fail at. It's something that I'm going to continue striving for and eventually obtain because he told me so. Um, he told me that, that we reach high expectations, that we um, expect a little bit more out of ourselves. So I think that that was a great lesson. Luckily, I've had great lessons from all of my coaches from age 11, just just feel like um, to collaboratively together, I feel very fortunate to have people who cared more about um, the person than, than the athlete themselves. And that's a really important way to coach, to make sure that their mental health is strong and their physical health is, is there. They're staying on top of that, living an athlete's lifestyle that Coach B. Hill always promoted. But I also believe that when coaches have these high expectations of their athletes that athletes should have high expectations of their coaches. And so we should all strive to be the best that we can be. And, and may that process never end. May we continue to learn and read and study and observe um, so that we can just continue to grow. And every day is an opportunity to open up that book, to open up your eyes and look around and see how we could be better at what we're doing. And I love that. And, and I think that approach to to learning and to developing and just to be in that positive mindset. I think, you know, that's, you know, it's broken down a lot of barriers. And I think, you know, you wrote your, your, mem your book about that. And I think I kind of want to get into that a little bit because the way that you framed your, your work ethic and the way that, you know, you've strived and reached these expectations and almost and surpassed them, I'm sure most of the time is, through that positive mindset. And, and I think that's where we struggle a lot is we focus the, a lot on the 
as athletes, I know I did this for personally, but we focus a lot on the negatives and we focus like I made a mistake, I missed this play or whatever. And then you spiral and you continue to go down. How is it that at such an elite level and such a competitive level that you're able to stay in that positive mindset and that frame of mind? I think it, very early on in my professional career, I saw how just a simple shift of my mindset could completely power me through a workout I previously thought I was incapable of doing. So seeing that was so thrilling to me that I just made a game of it, right? Like, okay, well, this thought isn't really serving me that, that well right now. Let's find another one that might take its place. And so just trying to like twist and turn these thoughts to see what I could get out of myself. And it became a really fun game that every day I showed up demanding the most out of myself physically, but also making sure I showed up mentally to, to play that same game of climbing in, in physical and mental fitness. And I think the only time I had a hard time with this was realizing, you know, every maybe more than a decade, I was seeing progress on my watch. I'm getting faster and faster and faster. And that's really thrilling to, to just be in a year after year cycle of that type of physical growth. And when I realized that I was no longer going to be running faster, why am I still out here doing it? So there was this, this little moment that I had, but I realized because I also was in the mental game that, well, just because I'm not getting faster doesn't mean that I can't be better. And so I still work just as hard to this day. I was grinding out intervals with my teammates yesterday in Shady Rest Park because I love to just show up mentally and really, really get the best out of myself. And I never want that to atrophy, that part of me to atrophy. I don't care if my arms get flabby or, um, or I, I start to spill out over my pants, but I, I don't want that optimism and that, that sharp mindset to, to ever atrophy. So running is how I keep it finally tuned. You know, I had, a, I had a question for you. As you talk about the mental aspect, it's something that, that I know Davis is interested in. When did you learn that, I mean, it's, our, the mental capabilities, it's not linear, it's not always. Linear. So when did you learn and how did you learn that it was okay to not be okay? Um, I did not learn that until I was on a European, the European track circuit, and I was on the B circuit because I was, um, it was my, my, maybe 1997 or 1998, early in my career, and I was over in Finland living with a family who didn't speak English, and I was lonely and getting depressed. I had my first and only anxiety attack, and I was I considered myself rock bottom at that moment. Like, what am I doing here? I could die in this house and nobody in the world will know where I am. And I was having such a hard time. And I had a little crisis moment calling Coach Behill from a payphone. If anybody knows what payphones are out there, um, called Coach Behill from a payphone. I made a collect call, unfortunately. That's how, that's how low I was. And he said, you know, you had a plan to be there and race and I don't want to see you until the end of the summer. And I screamed into the phone, I hate you. And I hung up on him and I pedaled back to the house in a, in a rainstorm, like I've never seen it rain before. And I just started laughing at the sight of me. I like almost an out of body experience, like anybody driving by, here's this pathetic blonde girl on the back of this, this old bicycle with mud splattering up my backside. And I must look as pathetic as I feel. And uh, I got back to the house and just thought, well, if I have to be here, I don't want to be in the same headspace, right? If I have to physically be here, I can't physically live with this. And so I just started making funny faces in the mirror. It was that simple just to like snap me out of it. And the rest of the summer was fantastic. And it was just switching. It was just realizing, okay, if I've got to do this, I've got to do it differently. And it was so powerful to realize, okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. I don't have to be in my little perfect bubble in Alamosa, Colorado with my greatest mentor at my side, making sure I showed up positive every day, teammates encouraging me, um, knowing what I'm gonna eat for dinner, breakfast and lunch because I'm the one planning it. I was just on a whim and realizing, okay, things don't have to be perfect to have a good day. And so I'm just gonna like, make sure I'm doing, I'm showing up for myself every day and doing something good for myself, whether it's making funny faces in the mirror or 
pedaling to the convenience store and buying a six pack of ice cream bars and eating them all because I didn't have dinner the night before and I was starving. Uh, so it's just like, just realizing, okay, it's, it's fine to, it's fine to, it's fine to struggle. It's fine to, to be in a bad head space, but you have the tools, even in an uncomfortable situation, you have the tools to get through this, to make it okay, to get to the other side. It can feel bad and it's okay to feel bad. You just hope tomorrow's going to be better. Do a few things for yourself that make tomorrow better. Switch the thought around. And, um, and so it was a really hard summer, but a very empowering summer to know that home is up here in my head. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be in my little bungalow in, in Alamosa, Colorado, my 600 square foot house. It could be, it could be anywhere I choose to, to take it. And, um, and that was a really important growth moment for me. That's it. Amazing. Like it, it's a very it's emotional so, story for you to tell. Like the, you were, yeah, you were, you were reliving that entire moment. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. Yeah, and 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 it's really easy to be positive and switch those those thoughts when when the world around you is calculated and perfect, which my my world in Alamosa was. I had my routine every day, but I was out of that routine and I forgot all of that stuff. I forgot all those tools that were working for me that I created the year and a half I was living in Alamosa and realizing, oh, I can take all that with me wherever I go was important. Yeah, that, yeah. that it can be good even when it's bad. And I think that that mindset, and I don't want to speak for you here too, but I think what that does is shape who you become after that, right? I think that's what really allowed you to understand you can control what you can control and you can't what you can't and you just move how you can throughout each and every day, just trying to strive to be better. And I think that's one of the things that as a as a young athlete, we kind of have to force ourselves into. And I, and I think to get past those personal journeys or get through those personal journeys is you're gonna have those highs and lows, but you have to rebound and overcome and figure out what works for you in order to, to get to that next step and not just quit, not just give up. But I think right now in our you know communities is we're putting so much pressure and so much stress on some of those athletes younger and younger that it's those moments are happening at a younger age. And, and I think it's breaking a lot of younger student athletes. I don't know your opinions or if you agree or not, but. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think we could take away this. We can't take away the stress. That's, um, that's something that society, society, I mean, I remember growing up and magazines were, were the, um, were at fault for eating disorders. And now we say that video games are, are at fault for violence or whatever it is. But I think we just need to have better coping skills, teach people that they have the ability within them. It's why mental health is such an important issue for me um, because it's, it's sad to me when people feel like they lost that hope. And to show them just little ways that they can that they can grab a hold or see that it's within them to um, that they're they're not a victim of of society but they're a part of society and they also have every capability within them to to engage or to completely shut out or to to walk away. There's so many different options for us to um, to use, but having the having the right mindset is everything and it takes it takes just as much conditioning as being at the top of your game in a sport um, it's going to take that type of diligence and it should be a critical importance not just for each individual to be that for themselves but it should be of critical importance for every team it should be critical importance for every corporate corporation or business that health and safety are often a number one priority but mental health should be right up there with them. I absolutely agree. And I think with some of the work that we do with these coaches, do you think that coaches need to be more aware of our, the mental health of our athletes or how do we, how do you think we should best address this next generation going through some of these struggles? I think, you know, you, you've really lived this elite athlete life and gone through a lot of different obstacles as well as, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't elite athletes, but are still facing those same obstacles. How do you think coaches, and people that are kind of in that support role for these athletes can better be suited to, or better prepared to, to handle those conversations that 
to walk through or talk through these situations for the younger athletes. Right. I mean, I, I really would love to see that there's a physical and mental aspect to every training program that it, they should be conditioned equally. ASICs, my partner, my sponsor for 21 years, they are an acronym, um, a Latin acronym, Anima Sana Incorpore Sano, or a sound mind in a sound body. And they have lived that mantra since the beginnings of the company right after World War II. And I love that that still, despite the fact that Mr. Onitsuka is no longer alive, that the company really does live that motto and emphasizes mental health, donates to mental health. And, um, and so I think, um, I think that should be a, a high priority, um, but also making sure that that's a priority for coaches themselves, coaches and leaders in, in organizations and institutions, because only when they're, they have clarity and strength and confidence and troubleshooting capabilities can, can they be the best for the team they're leading. So I think it's important across the board. And um, I, I, in coaching and leadership, it's, I think it's extra hard or maybe even more critical to have that, that mental fitness because your self-worth often depends on the performances of your team and that's a hard position to be in as a as a coach or leader of an organization so to make sure that they have the tools that their self-worth should lie in in checking those things off their list every day those you know conditioning themselves mentally and physically to lead and and having those priorities in line and not be um not judge themselves by the performances of the people that are working for them or under them. Absolutely. And I, I love the balance that you, you wanted to strike with the 50%, like training the mind and training the body, because, you know, we, we often say like 90% of the game or 90% of performance is mental. And we never train that. We never train those mental capacities for our younger athletes and as coaches, you know, we, we go through this like kind of this role learning process, get the physical pieces down, get the get your muscle memory in engaged and everything. But the mental aspect, which is such an important piece, is just kind of like a, a byproduct. It's almost like put on the back burners, just hoping that they did it right. You know, and, and I think it's so important to to really focus and be intentional with some of that training because we don't have those coping skills. And as a society, it's very difficult for a child to come in and have all this pressure put on them and be able to cope with some of that stress or those other stressors and peers, coaches, parents, all putting them on under that kind of spotlight and not having any coping skills to, to really understand what's going on and how to perform in that pressure. So I, I do love that. It's right. And it, it's, yeah, I mean, I even, I even deal with that with my own 10 year old daughter who has test anxiety. And I think, where did she get that from? Because, um, because we practiced and I said, you know, if, if the more you practice your, your nines times tables, the more you practice them, the more confident you're going to be taking the test. And she still gets so worked up when that clock starts and she needs to get it in in under a minute. And, um, and it's, it, it's a, it's a real life struggle. You, I could, it's almost like I could see the cortisol pumping through her veins when she thinks about taking, taking the test. And, um, and so just understanding that, that practice is your greatest advocate, because that gives you the mental confidence to go in and and um and and know your know your your numbers so um and she's only 10 it's sad to see stress in in young kids or or how many followers she has on tiktok and someone unfollowed her two days ago and she can't understand why and these are these yeah. are real life problems they seem a little comical but i would never laugh at them um and and the big thing now with, with the young kids are these poppets, which are stress toys. I'm thinking, oh my God, this seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine, 10-year-old kid, they're having stress toys? No, you shouldn't yeah. have stress toys. Be a kid, go out, get dirty, play around, stay up late, be right. a child. <laughs> and, and Yeah, and it's almost lost from, from our world now. It's like going out, getting bruised up and getting like scratches on the knees because TikTok or, you know, the social media and, and the stress anxiety or stresses that tests have. And I think, you know, you, you see it with your 10 year old daughter. I mean, I see it with, I have a four year old and he comes home from, you know, pre-K and he's like upset about a conversation that they had. And I'm like, it's, it's over. You're, you know, how do you, you know, manage to forget, 
even as a four-year-old to just move past it, right? Like they're, they have this emotional state and connection and empathy to everything, which is great, I think. But there's certain things like we were talking about before is this the way to cope with some of these stresses. And I think, you know, running or another hobby or sports is a great way to to release that in a, in a way to think and process through things almost at your own pace. And, and I want to almost use a marathon as that type of analogy, but it is it's you start off, you're excited, you're ready to go and then something happens, you still have to finish. And and I think there there's, you know, those barriers of mental or mental barriers that you come across even throughout your your running career or even throughout one single race that almost just mimic certain experiences that you go through in life. And I think that's what we just really need to, I guess, allow our children to find out, but at the same time, they, those coping mechanisms aren't necessarily there or being taught properly. Right, and I would say at the youth level that it's more critical for that mental fitness than the physical fitness itself. So that should be more emphasized because because running and agility on the on the soccer field is going to help for that season but the the mental side of it that those tools are going to be with them for a lifetime so it's much more critical i think to condition them young mentally so that we don't have the struggles the anxiety the um the depression that um is really just um i think with the addition of the pandemic has really surged in this country oh absolutely so being a, I mean, kind of a little bit off topic, but being a mother and a competitive runner and an entrepreneur and a, you know, <laughs> I guess event planner extraordinaire, how do you find time and manage it all? <laughs> oh, I, gosh, um, I learned from just watching people around me uh, because when I became a mom, I was a narrow focused athlete and that's all I did. Everything in my day revolved around training or recovery from that training. And so to have this little crying bundle divert my attention took a lot to, took a lot to, um, to digest. When I remember rushing back to try to get ready for the Olympic trials, trying to make my fourth Olympic team and crossing the finish line in sixth. And my very first thought was that I not only failed as an athlete, I also failed as a mother because my kid was finicky and cried all the time. And I was, and I felt guilty getting out the door to get in my training, but would rush back and kind of not sit around and stretch with my teammates. And it was such a hard moment to understand, but on a very nice road trip, uh, camping trip up the coast, came to the thought that, you know what, people all across the globe manage parenting and businesses and their running passion. And lucky for me, my running and, and my business are the same thing. So I should have it technically easier than everybody else. And so it was so nice to, uh, to just come to terms with the fact that I could be everything I want to be. I just have to give it 100% the moment, the, the moment that I'm in. So if I'm at home being a mom, I'm going to give it a hundred percent. If I'm in my running shoes, training around town, it's going to be a hundred percent. If I'm putting on events, I am all in and giving it a hundred percent. And so that's how I was able to get around it. Because in my mind, I had to give day in and day out a hundred percent physically and a hundred percent mentally to get the best out of myself. And I could still do that. I just had to do it in different silos of the day. <laughs> And that, I mean, it makes so much sense. And, and it's funny because I just saw this almost like a pregame speech that Deion Sanders did. He's, he's a football coach now, but he used to be a Hall of Fame football player. But he said very similar things like, we're so used to practicing just to practice, right? And I think we get used to it and not really focused on, you know, giving 100%. It's just that idea of, Oh, it's practice. I'm not going to give it 100%, or I'm just going to do it because it's it's there, and that's what we have kind of taken for granted. And we go through life sometimes just practicing, but it's not like this critical moment, or it's not a competition. So you're not going to give it 100%. But I love that you can put that into silos and say, "All right, 100% mom right now, 100% you know running right now," and and so and I think that's so inspiring because I. Most people need to do that, and it just doesn't happen because it's easier to take a step back and be like, "Oh well, I don't have to take care of you know this right now. It's you know it's it's, it's practice, right? It's not every day that I have to give 100, percent but it really is. You're you're changing the lives of not only your your family and your daughter, but 
the lives of everybody else on your team and, you, and the colleagues that you work with or the people that you run with and collaborate with, they all see the effort that's coming out and put, you're putting in. And it's just inspiring that just to hear that too. And I, I think you create, you create the space in your head to be a problem solver and don't stop until you solve it. And that to me was that road trip up the coast. I was like, I got a lot to think about right here. Am I continuing on with this running thing? Well, I don't feel over, like I still really love it, but I also really enjoy being a mom and I want to, I want to, I want to be good at it um, equally. And, um, and so how am I going to solve this? And I've got a lot of miles ahead to solve it. So let's find a way to solve it. And so you just mull it over and mull it over until the until the right solution until it feels right you feel the things click into place and you're like okay i can deal with this 100 percent with whatever hat i'm wearing in the moment and i can and i could live with that it's really it's it sounds like you know it's the the next book is your, your own personal collaboration because you have to collaborate with yourself there's the running self there's the mom self there's the business self then there's the personal self and all four of those Oh, there could be more than four, but all four of those have to collaborate to have a complete life. But that internal collaboration is, it's not easy for any of us. Uh, you know, David has a job and he's got two kids. And, um, and so it's, we all have that, the need for that collaboration, but that's not a tool that, that coaches teach and businesses, frankly, don't care. Um, but uh, I think that's, I think Probably worth you guys exploring in a, in another session is that personal collaboration. Yeah, and it's that's really important to touch on because we all need mentors and we need mentors for for those different hats that we wear, right? The the coaching the coaching side of us and the the mentoring side of us, the momming, uh, parenting side of us. They all have. I, I try to see people and look up to people. Um, um, whether it's it's friends or um, people I read about in books, it could be fictitious characters even. Um, but as I'm negotiating in my head, all those different characters um, that I live um, have different voices and they're the voices I, I consider my mentors to have. So it's funny that those conversations that happen, I don't think I've ever said this out loud or even thought about it in that capacity, but the the um, conversations in, in my head all have all have their own voice and, and reasons for um, trying to pull me in a different direction. Well, I think yeah. It was once described, I heard it once described that your personality, that you're like an octagon and, and the internal part of the octagon stays the same and that's you. But the external piece, you, you rotate it around for, for work, for mom, for life, for kids, for PTA. So it's that it's that external side that that the octagon well, I thought was a very interesting analogy. That's exactly what you just described. Absolutely. And I think they all inspire one another, right? Like you want to become a good runner because you want to be a good mother, and you want to become a good mother because you want to become a good entrepreneur and business owner, and and so on. So I think they all have that part, and they all collaborate. And once that clicks, you're like, oh, okay, I can use this to leverage this this methodology or whatever it is. It's it it builds upon one another and that kind of sets you in that foundational piece and definitely humbles you because, you know, there's always ways that you can get better as a parent or as a coach or as a competitive runner or whatever or athlete. I think it all helps in that sense. Yeah. And I, you know, the Chinese have a word Kaizen um, and it's the principle of unending achievement and always just setting and achieving higher goals. And to me, that's just, that just sums up life, right? So they, there might be some really great things that we've done in our past, but we're not over. There's still so much to accomplish and look forward to and to get us out of bed to strive for every day. And I, um, I think every morning I wake up with a thrill and a buzz. It might be after a few sips of coffee, but I wake up with this thrill and this buzz to just get the day started and, and keep, continue making that progress in some way. And it could be small. They don't like great things don't happen because you take these enormous leaps. They happen because you took all these tiny steps. And, um, and so I wake up every day just thinking, okay, here's another opportunity to get a little closer to being amazing. <laughs> That's great. Do you, kind of going on the same veins, where do you see yourself with these smaller steps and where do you see yourself in like five years, 10 years from now as a mom, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, as a runner, what does that look like for you? I think um, 
very similar to, to now, but just, just bigger and better. I see myself saving up to buy my daughter a car if her grades are good enough. I see, I see um, trying to build on the events, become um, happy events that we put on here, grow enormously um, from a sponsorship perspective, but also participation perspective. I see continuing to travel to, to races. And I think one of, the, um, one of the great things that came out of this pandemic, besides being so savvy with virtual communication um, has been that that races now can can be hosted hosted actually and virtually and that just explodes opportunity for fundraising and charity work and um, and other businesses getting involved um, within the events themselves so that really excites me that I think um, I think it's the London Marathon is trying to have 50,000 virtual runners and 50,000 actual runners. 100,000 people completing a, a, a marathon um, is, is so thrilling to me. Like just the goal itself is thrilling. Whether they reach that benchmark or not, the goal itself is, is just excited me to read about it. It's that high expectations piece, right? <laughs> yep, absolutely. absolutely. So kind of thinking along those same lines too is, what is and, and kind of backtracking a little bit too is what's one thing that has stuck with you over the years that either you know a mentor or a coach has kind of passed on that you're going to continue and go move into the forward or that you've just held on to that's really inspirational that's really kind of helped you grow as a person as a as a runner competitive or even a mother what are the, some of those things yeah i think um one of the number one things um, was my first coach, Bill Dooley, who just was all about joy, like get out there and let's let's explore on a trailhead. And it's something when when it starts to become a grind, the training gets monotonous day in and day out. I know I just need to find a new trailhead and just experience that immense joy um, that being out exploring nature gives to me. So that has always remained part of the core of who I am as a as a runner. Um, but then also Coach V. Hill talking about living an athlete lifestyle. That was mind blowing to me that anything I did outside of my running shoes mattered for my running. And it, it seemed so naive that in the years I had already spent running that I didn't know that. But I gave it my all in practice. I was really good at practicing. But I didn't realize that nutrition and sleep and all the extracurricular activities that that all had a major part to do with recovery and and fitness and um, and I think that that was so exciting to understand that I just wanted to create every day to be so that it allowed me to be my best self and it turns out that everything I enjoy doing um, is also good for my running. I love to read and I like to write and journal. Um, I love to sleep 12 hours a night. <laughs> so everything was kind of catered, catered to, to being a better athlete, but it was really, um, that to me was, was mind blowing at the time that I was an athlete 24 seven. And as soon as I started treating myself like one, it was amazing how successful I was every time I got out there. Right. I really appreciate that just because we often forget we go back to after practice or after a game and we're just like, oh, I just exercise really hard. I'm going to go get McDonald's. Right. Or <laughs> I'm going to sleep in and, and not stick to kind of that bodily routine because our bodies do want that routine. They want to perform at high levels. But if we don't feed it the right fuel or if we don't you know, give it enough rest, it's not going to perform. And, it, and that's the, something that we as coaches and as people need to be better at right like how can we really treat our bodies and our, our our even our minds too as that athlete every or 24 7 and i and i think we often forget that as i mean even if we're in a i guess lesser less privileged area they don't have access to some of the high quality foods that you know people in the more privileged areas do so they have food deserts and, and so on so even with that, we have to make those conscious decisions and choices of what we're putting in our bodies, what we're doing for our bodies and being able to to make that. But sometimes it's not as easy. Right. And and growing up in a very privileged household where I was able to play hockey and you're able to run and, and do all this. I think that has it speaks volumes, but also at the same time, how can we challenge those stigmas? Right. If, 
of being an athlete, how, if you can't afford it. And, and I think that's a very difficult and come to realization for a lot of people too, is I want to be that, but I can't, you know, so. Right. And I think sometimes the, the decision itself, whether you don't have an organic produce box that lands at your doorstep every Thursday afternoon, that's not, the, that is less of the point than the intention of being in the grocery store, even if it's a, um, even if it's like a 99 cent store and consciously purchasing certain things to fuel you better, something that has a little bit of, protein. I'm going to buy this cheap bag of nuts because it's going to give me some, some inexpensive protein and so that I can build my muscles. It's almost that the intention is, is more important than the actual product itself that you're putting in. So um, eating with the intention to, to fuel and strengthen and nurture um, is, is part of the, is part of the game. It's the mental side of eating. That's important. You can emotionally eat. You just have to eat with the right emotion. <laughs> and, um, and it also, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking of for years, it annoyed me that I would always hear like people would leave work at home or leave, leave work at work. At, like when they walk in the door, work is, is out, you know, is, is left at, at work or whatever the saying is. Um, um, but don't bring your work home with you. Gosh, I don't know why that took so long to get. That, that saying always really annoyed me because if you really worked at enjoying your job, whether it's, it's some monotonous line job you have in an automobile factory, making sure you're connecting in the, in the, at the water cooler in between so that, so that there's a little bit of joy coming home with you, reflect on those joyful parts of your job share that with your family at the table because they want to see that that you are enjoying um all the hard work that you're putting in the hours of the day don't leave it don't leave it at work bring it home with you but bring the good home acknowledge it um and i would i do this um this exercise on these airbnb um, experiences that i host um and we we talk about a lot about gratitude and um and one woman said that when she when they sit down at the dinner table they do this game called rose rose thorn bud so it's the best part of your day the worst part of your day and then what you're looking forward to tomorrow and i thought that that was so important because if we're just obnoxiously talking about the silver linings to the world in chaos around us that's not really being optimistic or helping so it's important to acknowledge some some bad parts of your day the parts of your day you dreaded or that you struggled through but then also giving a little hope for the next day to get out of bed the next day and so i've adopted that exercise and it's been really fun for our family to do we do the same thing and, and we do it with our four-year-old and we say what's the best part of your day what what made you sad and what are you looking forward to tomorrow and it, it made our you know dinner kind of talks and conversations so much more impactful because it shows that we are human. We do have bad parts. It's not just coming home and like, we have to be happy and it's okay to be vulnerable and it's okay to have sad parts of your day. And even though you may not, there's still something that maybe was off, right? It didn't feel, wasn't a joyous event and you can still talk about it, but it's, it's something that you're able to share with the family and they see the good, the bad and, and things to look forward to that hope piece that we often forget because we always get so focused on what happened right right here right now and there is no broader picture bigger picture yeah and it shows our children at a young age that it's okay to be vulnerable and to show and to show that and share that and and to talk it out or or just to sit and listen and that's i think a really hard thing for me that i'm trying to teach myself to do better is that Sometimes your kids just want to vent and you just have to listen and other times they're looking for a solution. So um, I have to like take off my solutions hat and just I can strategize up here in my head, but don't make it come out of your mouth, Dina. Come on, you can do this. Just listen to her. Okay. <laughs> that was one of the things that my parents passed on to me is like, I think it was, do you want to lend in, do you want me to lend a, like a lending ear? Do you want me to find a solution for you? Or do you want me to take action? And 90% of the time they said that all we wanted was just somebody to hear us and just to hear us out. And I think kind of reflecting back on what for coaches, we need to be able to do that too, right? We need to be able to understand that our student athletes and, and our athletes have stuff that they want to talk about, and but they just need that kind of capacity or that kind of area and, and space to do so in a comfortable 
in a vulnerable state. And it's okay to share those things with the coach because sometimes they are more impactful or they are people that see the kind of vulnerability side of you. So I think it's, it's something that we need to be able to coach as coaches too. Yeah, absolutely. And that thorn piece or the vulnerability piece, I realized um, more so than ever after writing my book and getting feedback from, from so many people, the hardest things that I shared, even a few parts that I wanted to take, remove from the book altogether, because I was afraid they were going to hurt somebody's feelings, like the family I stayed with in Finland or my uh, my teammates who totally turned their backs and dissed me. I was like, oh, yeah, I got, let's just keep them out of it. Keep this story out. They're the stories that people resonate with because they've been hurt before or they've felt depressed or have anxiety and and to see to make sure that you not only share your vulnerability, but but how you got through it is an important tool to pass on to people. And I feel like that part of the book was more impactful than any other part. The highs of medals and records, nobody mentions. That was good. there. Maybe I get a thumbs up every now and then, but it's the it's the parts that were hard, the the major defeats, the um, and the and the darker parts of of my story that people really resonated with and really want to talk about. Yeah, and, and I think it, it humanizes us, right? It humanizes everybody. And even though we, we may think like we're at top of the world with those medals, there's so many other things that led us there or helped us get there. And, and some of it were those lows and some of it were those highs. And, and I think that's really important to acknowledge is success isn't just a straight line. It's It goes up and down, you know, mountains and valleys, and we just have to ride the wave and just go for it. But I think we don't see it that way. We don't see LeBron James success, Simone Biles success and what they've gone through. And, and what I really appreciate about the Olympics too this year is to see Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka, Arasaki just take a step back and say, I'm not there. Like mentally, I cannot compete because I'm not there. And for to have somebody at the top of the game, the one of the premier athletes of the world say that, it just brings so much more recognition to the sport, to the mental capacity and health of athletes, especially at that such a high level. And people are watching constantly, millions of people are eyes on. And it just, it's being, it rings true to, to show that athletes are people. They're not just these robotic, let's go through the motions. We're just physically gifted. There's so much more to it. And it's, it's something that we need to recognize at a younger age too. Yeah, and because that was on full display um, in Tokyo, I feel like um, I feel like it made her much more relatable, Simone Biles, mm -hmm. that she was obviously the poster child of the entire Olympic story this um, this summer. But uh, she was kind of up here, and people just watched. She was an entertainer, um, an athlete, an entertainer, and that immediately made her relatable and made her get, certainly gained her more fans. I definitely think so. And I, and I think it's it's something that we need to acknowledge too as a society of what we're doing to our younger generations of athletes is it's not just entertainment. It's not just performance. It's so much more than that. And it's people that are putting themselves out there giving 110% and physically as well as mentally. And, and like we've talked about this whole time is it's not just that physical aspect that we need to be training and working for. It's, it's that mental piece too, that we need to uplift and, and help coach and prove and kind of coax out as a, as a coach and as a kind of society of really bringing the best out of that positive mindset and that kind of growth mindset that you've been talking about in your book. And you've been talking about this whole interview is just it's something that's so important that we need to continue. And I, and I love the stories that you've shared because it, it does resonate and it does show that we all have those growth opportunities within us, even though we've all struggled. It almost seems comical at the beginning of our conversation talking about some secret training. Like there's really no secrets in training. Like these, this, these are the energy systems you tax. We do mile repeats and we do tempo runs and we do long runs and they all tax our energy system in different ways, which create a fuller athlete. It's the mental stuff that's really gonna, gonna elevate this next generation to empower them, empower them in sport, but more so for, for life, which is so much more important than any Think sport can give us absolutely and i think i mean they all they're all intertwined and they all just pr prove just to the human capabilities the human capacity and the emotional capacity that we all have to have to to move forward yeah and i i feel like um sports are 
um, is such a great way to um, to train your mental side for someone wanting to, to, to work at it a little bit more because we don't want to welcome challenge and disruption in our lives to try to tax ourselves or to, to try to, to strengthen our mental game. But sport, you could get there any day. You could just push your limits a little bit, make, make that strain happen, and then work on the thoughts to get you through it. Work on that, um, that mental endurance and, um, and resiliency. Um, start, start cultivating it there. And what a great way to, to use sport to, to strengthen your mind, because usually it's your mind that's providing your, um, your craft um, to, to reach your potential in your craft. But what if we used the opposite? What if we used our craft to strengthen our, our mental side? And what a, what a great gift that would be, a lifetime gift that would, that would offer us. I love that. That's such a great way to put that too, because I think we often talk about the power of sport, but never actually talk about how that can really empower us too. So I love that. Tim, is there any more questions you have? Because I mean, Dina, I think you've answered so many of my questions. I had other ones that were completely off topic, but I don't want to take away from the power that we've already talked about so many emotional pieces that, you know, are mentally draining, but also great to, to have and hear from you. So Tim, is there anything else that you want to add in? Oh, Tim, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> I was checking my speaker. I'm in, a, I'm in a flyover zone here by the, in, uh, I'm in, I'm near West Palm Beach Airport. So um, what I was thinking was that, that the points that you made um, about where, where you, where you were able to get to mentally are things that, that somehow Davis and his programs need to teach. I think a lot of coaches don't, don't have that. They don't have the skill set to say, okay, we're going to work on this. The reason we're doing this really hard work at is not only is it going to improve your body, it's going to improve your mind. And, and, and half of this workout is for your mind. And I think that I think some of the things that you've said need to go back so that the athletes understand that the purpose of this particular workout or, or this particular two week section of training is not just to get you physically better. It's to get you mentally uh, more prepared. And I and I do think that that, that mental preparation, I've told Davis this before, I ran my businesses exactly the way I coached my teams, zero difference. And it was because it was, what's the goal? What are the, what, what are the, what are the components we have? Do we have the right team? If we don't, what are the pieces we have to put in place? And it's zero different than, than running a business. And, and you're doing the same thing in, in your business and your events. And Davis does the same thing in, in, uh, in the businesses that he's got. Going. So it's, it's kind of refreshing to see how it works. I love that. Well, Dina, again, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And, and you know, you're really an inspiration to so many people out there. And, and I think having having you on and sharing your vulnerabilities and some of the stories that you went through just speaks volumes to what our coaches and what our next generation need to kind of challenge themselves with. And I think that's the, the point and what we're trying to do with Capita is really show that there's a lot of work to do. But, but some of it that we've lived through and, and you more so than, and other, than others, I think, I think it's, it just really embodies that type of mentality and that persona that really shows what success can look like after you put yourself through some of these things. Awesome. It's, it's so great. I love the, I love the work that you're doing. So any other way I can help, I'm, I'm game. Absolutely. And, and we'll stay in touch for sure, because I think there's some other aspects that will definitely reach out for you and, and see just to hear the compellingness in, in your, your stories again. But the, the entrepreneurship, the, the female leadership roles, there's so many things that I find, find inspiring about you and your story. It's, it's, it's amazing. So thank you so much. And you're such it's going to be so impactful for our, our coaches to hear some of your, your thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Take care. Have a wonderful have a yoga session. Yes. <laughs> I could probably use some yoga. I am like the tightest, tightest wound um, body in the world. Oh, well, there you go. Now you have the yoga retreat to, to really yeah. come that way. I think I always, I always figured if I could see my toes, I'd stretch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I'm hoping everybody's Zen kind of like rubs off on me just, just by virtue of a nice breeze blowing it my right. way. <laughs> just walk down that smoothie shop down the way. A little yeah, bit. yeah. Now that I'm buzzing from this coffee. <laughs> I don't normally drink coffee in the afternoons, but when I do, I feel it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks <laughs> thanks again. again, you guys. Take care. Be well. Bye.